This is Theology on the Go, a brief interview about an eternal truth. I wanted to persuade them that the things that they rightly wanted to protect, the central elements of the gospel, uh, the greatness of God, these kind of things, that these things are actually best protected through the appropriate biblical use of creeds and confessions. I wanted to make a case, if you like, that the Bible itself doesn't demand that we have creeds and confessions in order to be good Christians, but certainly points us towards the idea of something like creeds and confessions as a way of making sure that the, uh, the faith is carefully safeguarded from generation to generation. Hello and welcome to Theology on the Go. I'm Jonathan Master, joined as always by my friend and co-host, James Dolazel. James, how are you today? I'm well, Jonathan, and uh, looking forward to our discussion. It is always great to uh, have Carl Truman join the program, a good friend of both of ours, longtime friend, someone that we've uh, admired, whom we've learned from. uh, And we're here to discuss just one of his recent books. He's, He's a prolific writer, of course, but this book is Crisis of Confidence, Reclaiming the Historic Faith in a Culture Consumed with Individualism and Identity, published by Crossway. And so, Carl, thanks for joining us to talk about Crisis of Confidence. It's great to be here. You make me sound real good. Uh, you could have said some well, more nice tr- stuff about me. We though, try. Yes. We try. Yeah. I mean, we have limited time. We try to we try to keep it tight here. So I just had to hit the highlights, but uh, much more could be said. Um, no, we're grateful for you coming on. And, and this book, just to let our listeners know, is um, a revised edition of an earlier book that I believe you came on the podcast to talk about. A uh, number of years ago, the creedal imperative, and so maybe what we can do—it's not the same as the creedal imperative. But we want to get to that a little bit later in the interview, but but let's start with the creedal imperative. I remember um, I remember meeting with you when you had turned in that manuscript, and you said you thought this was this was one of the last things that was sort of on your list of of books you always wanted to write. And obviously, yes. it wasn't the last book you yeah, wrote. Yeah, yeah. Every, but every it book was, is the last one I want to write. Yeah, no, but, but I remember <laughs> you, I very distinctly remember, I remember exactly where we were. And I remember distinctly you saying, you know, this was, this was, I wanted to write the Owen stuff and I wanted to do a few other things. And then I wanted to write something on creeds. And so you did that in the creedal imperative. And so maybe summarize for us, for our listeners who haven't read the creedal imperative, what the basic contours of your argument were in that book. Yeah. Well, the the basic purpose of the book was I wanted to try to persuade um, evangelicals of a a kind of Bible church variety who typically have a a suspicion of things like creeds and confessions as somehow compromising biblical sufficiency. I wanted to persuade them that the things that they rightly wanted to protect, the central elements of the gospel, Uh, the greatness of God, these kind of things, that these things are actually best protected through the appropriate biblical use of creeds and confessions. I wanted to make a case, if you like, that the Bible itself doesn't demand that we have creeds and confessions in order to be good Christians, but certainly points us towards the idea of something like creeds and confessions as a way of making sure that the uh, the faith is carefully safeguarded from generation to generation. So I really wanted uh, to get it. Uh, it. It was a book to persuade. You, the temptation for, for reform guys like ourselves is is often to look down with condescension on people who don't belong to Presbyterian churches, Reform Baptist churches, whatever. I wanted to write a book that would persuade my evangelical friends that there's something they're missing that would actually help them uh, protect, promote, and preserve the things that they rightly most wish to promote, protect, and preserve. So that was 2012. It's a perennial argument. Uh, it it doesn't, doesn't get old, but, um, and still a discussion today in, in, in those circles. So that, but that was 2012. Now this book is published in 2024 and a number of things have changed in the culture, which, which I take to be one of the, premises almost behind behind the revisions that mm, there, there's more yeah. to be said now about a crisis of confidence yeah. in the context of our of our cha- rapidly changing culture yeah 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 a number of things uh, uh and things in some ways that i did touch on in in the first edition uh, 
But I would say one of the things that has become more imperative in the years since I first wrote it is, is the need for, for sort of a broad catechizing of the church, that more and more of what we think about life has to be directly grounded on the church's teaching. Now, what do I mean by that? It's, it's not that you know, all of our knowledge should not ultimately have been biblical in some ways in times past, but it's that the, the culture around about us carries much less of the weight that we need carried than the church does, particularly in areas like anthropology. What does it mean to be human? What, are, what What's sexual morality, et cetera, et cetera. We're in a situation now where we can't, we, we have to directly teach these things. They will not be picked up through the general culture as the way perhaps they were when you and I were younger. Okay, the, the country wasn't a Christian country, but the moral framework, the understanding of what it meant to be human was broadly compatible with what the Bible taught. That's not the case anymore. So the, you know, if you like, the pedagogical burden in terms of its comprehensiveness falls much more heavily on the church now. And that in that context, Creeds, confessions, and catechisms provide us with ready-made frameworks or models for thinking about how to do that and for working uh, uh, towards that. Uh, secondly, uh, we need to understand always that Christian doctrines exist in relationship to each other. So it's useful to have a vision for how the doctrine of God, the doctrine of Christology, uh, salvation, the doctrine of man, ethics, morality, sexuality, how these things, they're not stand alone, but they connect to each other. And that's sometimes hard to see from the Bible because the Bible is a, a it has a theological unity, but it's a disparate collection of books and literature, et cetera, et cetera. What the great confessions of the church do, say the Westminster Confession or the Anglican 39 Articles or the London, the second London Confession, uh, plagiarized as it was mainly from the Westminster Confession, I have to say. <laughs> granted, but, granted. But, but, but what, what they do is they set out in relatively short compass the structure of Christian doctrine as well. And I think that's very helpful. So, for example, if your church has a 10-point a statement of faith, and, you know, I, I want to rejoice that your church has a statement. But that's good. If those points are good points, that's great. But unfortunately... Christianity can't be reduced to 10 points. And those 10 points themselves have implications beyond themselves or rest upon other points that may not be stated. And so the 10 points can be rather unstable if that's all you, you look at. It's good to have a much broader frame where everything connects. Take, for example, um, the issue of gay marriage. You know, I remember somebody in 2014, 2013, 2014 says we need to add a paragraph to the Westminster Confession of Faith on the gay mar on gay marriage. And my view is, well, that's you can certainly argue that case, but look at what the confession teaches about marriage. Connects it to Christ, it gives a positive vision, and thereby excludes all false alternatives. You know, we don't need a statement on gay marriage, really, because actually it's clear that that's wrong from the confession. The confession can only do that because it's teaching on marriage connects to all of these other doctrinal points. So as the world out there gets more hostile and puts pressure on more and more issues for Christianity, particularly ethical and moral issues, the need to see how our doctrine of God ultimately connects to the way we think about right and wrong in the way we live our lives, that's an important vision to give people. It's hard to do that on one or two sermons a week it's much easier to do that if you give somebody a catechism, give somebody a confession and say, look at the structure, look how it all fits together. And that brings me to my final point, which will be a very brief one, and that is, and the great thing about the great creeds and confessions is they're focused on God. They really remind us that God is not there for our convenience, that he is transcendent, and we need to look outward to him for our reality, not inward to our feelings, which is becoming the default in our contemporary culture. Carl, in the book, you do acknowledge uh, that there is a legitimacy to subjectiveness and to feelings. Yeah. Uh, so this is not a question of head over heart in some kind of exclusivistic way. <laughs> How could, let's just take the Westminster Confession, really a, a, a great 32 chapters yeah. with multiple sub points and lots of proof texts added later. Yeah. And how how does that actually address itself to a culture that puts a premium on feelings without 
removing right. the the legitimacy of being a person with feelings and yet situating that in in a context that actually is more definitive than the feelings themselves. Yeah, that's a very good question, James. And I, and I think my answer here would be we need to understand that the confession itself needs to be understood within a form of church life, so to speak. You know, the confessions fulfill certain functions. They don't fulfill every function that has to go on in the church. They fulfill certain functions within the church. And then I would, what I would say is this, very helpful to me in thinking about the head heart, the doctrine, feelings thing has been Psalm 73. Because in Psalm 73, you have the, you know, the psalmist is wrestling with that issue that we, you know, almost every Christian wrestles with at some point. Yeah. The scumbags seem to live long and prosper and they die peaceful deaths, whereas the good people seem to suffer and struggle and then they die horrible deaths young. Why is this? And the psalmist he uses very strong feeling language. He says, you know, my feet had almost slipped which is psalmist poetic way of saying, I almost lost my faith. I, I, I almost just threw it through in the town and walked away. But he says, until I went to the sanctuary and then their end was revealed to me. Well, what's the sanctuary? The sanctuary, of course, is the place where uh, the Ark of the Covenant is. It's the place where God has revealed himself to be a covenant God towards his people. In other words, the psalmist's Thoughts in that psalm, the psalmist's thoughts and feelings are not dismissed. They're taken very seriously indeed. But ultimately, they come to make sense and only make sense in, in face of the objective reality of God's revelation. So to go back to the, the confession, I would say, well, okay, you know, if somebody comes to me uh, and says, Dr. I'm really, really struggling with, you know, the fact that scumbags live to old age and they get very wealthy and they own Bond villain yachts and, you know, and, and I'm struggling to put, you know, bread on the table and I'm a godly guy, what's going on? I, I may not say, okay, read the Westminster Confession. that It'll solve your problem. But in my mind, in my pastoral strategy, I'm going to be thinking, well, the Westminster Confession, what does it do? It really points me to the, the great objective truths of God. And therefore, what I need to do with this person here and now, I need to find a way of communicating those great truths to him or her. So I might start then by, by first of all, showing I take their feelings seriously, then introducing the objective truths. And then maybe at some point in the conversation saying, and you know, this is beautifully summed up in this question in the catechism, or it's beautifully summed up in this paragraph in the confession. So I do think there's hope for the confession today, even in our world of feelings. It just has to be used wisely and appropriately within a much broader form of church life and, and pastoral strategy. Is it possible, maybe I'll put it in terms of a, a modern question. Is it possible to be confessional and adhere to, let's say, a 17th century confession, maybe 375 years old? H how in that framework could we be on the right side of history? Is it possible to be on the right side of history and be rooted in something so antiquated? Yeah. Uh, is uh, that's it. Well, first of all, just a general comment on the phrase, the right side of history. What always intrigues me about people who use that phrase is they usually use it to justify overthrowing everything history's ever taught on this issue. <laughs> how, so, how do you know yeah, what the right yeah, side yeah. of history is well, when this is a novel right proposal? Side. Yeah. You know, being on the right side of history on gay marriage is getting rid of everything history's ever taught us about what marriage is. Uh, and also think, you know, what would being on the right side of history have looked like in Berlin in 1934? You know, mm -hmm. the immediate culture and the direction of the immediate culture is no di is no sound guide to moral truth, I would say. It's only a sound guide to the moral tastes of the day. Uh, so when it comes to a 17th century document, I'd say, well, this is not a knockdown argument for the authority of the confession. But I would say when a confession is still speaking to people today, when it's still found to be useful, when there are pastors across this country and across other countries, not least South Korea, which is not exactly white and American in its culture, uh, when a document like that transcends time and space and continues to resonate with people, it doesn't necessarily mean it's true, but it's certainly a strong argument in favor of taking it seriously. So 
there is this thing. Yeah, we don't take 17th century documents seriously. Well, I, I'm not sure. Uh, people still read the Iliad today and, and learn things from it. Uh, people still, uh, you know, most of us who are not qualified in quantum physics or the theory of relativity still feel that the the, you know, Newton's laws of gravity work pretty well, but the way we experience life at, you know, slower than the speed of light. <laughs> um, I, I tend to think, you know, is it a perfect document? No. Uh, but it's a document that has spoken across time, across space, and is therefore worth taking seriously. Carl, you mentioned the gay marriage um, discussion that you had early on where someone suggested adding a chapter on gay marriage or something like that. And you pointed out rightly mm-hmm. that, that, that the Westminster confession dresses marriage yeah. very helpfully. And, and, and interestingly enough, lots of churches with 10 point doctrinal statements had had to add something yeah. on marriage uh, for all kinds of reasons, legal reasons, but also just reasons of proclamation. And, and, and Westminster already had made that clear. But as you've thought through the various other issues that have emerged, particularly in the last 10 years, are there ones where you've said, oh, well, I actually wish there was greater yeah. clarity in our confession on that? Or or have you again and again reached the same conclusion, which is, you know, it's all there. It's all yeah. that we have the resources confessionally that we we need to train a, a generation yeah. immersed in all this. Yeah, I, I think that's a good question, Jonathan. But, you know, without wanting to sort of be a, a Presbyterian triumphalist, uh, I don't mean this in this way, but I, I, I think that the domination like the Orthodox Presbyterian Church or the Presbyterian Church in America, we have, because we have the ability to produce reports on particular issues, that somewhat defuses the need for revising the confession. So when, when I say we don't need to add to the confession for gay marriage, that's not to say that a report on gay marriage that doesn't rise to the level of the confession, but is an extremely helpful document for pastors trying to think about how the confession applies to the issue of gay marriage and how to pastorally apply the confession to the issue. S- reports like that are very useful. And certainly I would think many of the issues that have popped up in the last 10 years, not least gender, uh, and I have to say, it's a refreshing change to be on a podcast when I'm not talking about men convince their women. Very refreshing. <laughs> uh, the issue of gender, I think, is one where certainly reports are called for. Now, it may well be that, you know, I've, I've not really wrestled so far with what the confession has taught about anthropology, but some of the specific questions that are coming up about gender. It may be that an addition is necessary. As a, If you're a true confessionalist, of course, you're always committed to the idea that the confession in and of itself is not a final document. Scripture is the final norming norm. And that means that hypothetically, you always have to be open to revision or addition. What I would say about adding to me is I would want to work long and hard at answering the question before I open the, the issue of revision or addition. I'd want to, if you like, have the working assumption that the confession is sufficient and work on that basis and only revise it or add to it as a last resort if that proved to be unhelpful. And I do think, going back to how I opened this answer, I do think the issue of there of General Assemblies commissioning groups of theologians and pastors and elders to work on particular issues and produce helpful reports uh, is 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 one of the great blessings of being in a denomination, and I think James, the the Reformed Baptists in America have a similar kind of mechanism. Do you not that that you can sort of get together fraternally to produce documents that aren't necessarily denominationally binding, but are helpful for pastors? Circular letters. So if there's a controversy okay. over eternal generation, somebody can write up a. 20 page paper and circulate it in an official uh, capacity. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, and I think this is wise just in as much as every wind of, of change that blows through culturally doesn't warrant a revision of your yeah. doctrinal statement or of your confession. But I, I would, I would nominate you for the committee drafting the form of response when thruple becomes a uh, officially uh, sanctioned uh, activity in the United oh, States. Oh, gosh. Or, but we I have... think what we should say is, but doesn't the confession already deal with that problem even before yeah. it becomes officially yeah. one yeah. we're facing? Well, uh, and, and that was the other point I would make as well. It's, it's not a question of does the confession address everything? Does it address, yeah. you know, how to handle a sexual abuse allegation in, in, a, in a church? 
Well, no, it doesn't address it. But the question is, as a as a sum, faithful summary of biblical teaching and as a uh, a document which we can disciple a new generation of Christians with effectively and comprehensively. Yeah, I think that that's that's more the question. And and I think it on that on that score, it it, 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 uh, it holds up well. Yeah, I would just add, this is just as an aside, but sort of relatively speaking, for those listening who are members of independent churches or Bible churches, uh, don't assume that the best thinking on any issue comes from the publisher's catalogs. Check out denominational websites and look for General Assembly reports and synod reports, because you'll find some great documents. For example, the PCA's report on sexuality from a couple of years ago. You'll find downloadable reports on key moral and ethical issues that that have some great biblical wisdom there. And they're a resource that I think a lot of independents are unaware of, but are a rich and untapped vein of, of help. Carl, one last question, because we are out of time. But as you... Um as you reevaluated what you wrote in Creedal Imperative, it sounds like what you're saying is you're, you're, you still, you would still make the same argument today. You just see increasing applications yeah. uh, of, of the confession uh, or, or there, 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 there's even more usefulness for it today or more need for it today than, than, than you might've even thought back in 2012. Is that, is yes. that a fair? Yes. The, pr- the principle that, Creeds and confessions allow us to do important biblical things in our churches. It remains the same, but the the book really contains some additional material on on some other things that have come up in the last days. And also, you know, for example, I, I, I've changed some of the examples. You know, it's amazing when you read a book that's ten years old. You're like, wow, nobody's talked about that for eight years. How dated does that? You know. I didn't do this, but, you know, it's no longer cool to quote Napoleon Dynamite and think you're on the cultural cutting <laughs> edge kind of thing. Uh, so there are, there are some smaller revisions like that. But, yeah, by, by and large, it's, wow, creeds and confessions are even more useful today than they were 10 years ago, and this is why. Well, Carl, thanks for your work in the creedal imperative. Thanks for your work in updating it in this uh, new form, Crisis of Confidence, Reclaiming the Historic Faith in a Culture Consumed with individualism and identity. And thanks for giving us some of your time today. We really appreciate it. It's been a pleasure, guys. Good to see you.